Um, actually, I'll start the yeah. So starts the recording now. Um, you talked about traditional media. How do you differentiate like what you do, like digital media and film, from like traditional? Yeah, I feel like when we think about traditional media, it's really like TV and film, right? And then there's digital media, which is still very new. And I, I feel like digital content itself has really started to explode in the past decade. But before that, everything was really TV and film. And when I think about traditional media, you have to, you know, go out to pitches. You have general meetings with Hollywood executives. You uh, maybe get your idea greenlit to become a movie or a TV show and whatnot. And that entire process takes a really, really long time. But when we think about digital content, the barriers to entry are so low that you can pick up your phone today, just film yourself doing, I don't know, a dance challenge and then upload it. And then instantly that piece of content is out there in the world. And that's made by you. A decade ago, that opportunity wasn't out there at all. So that's how I differentiate between digital and traditional. But we, we are in a very interesting space, especially in the past, I feel like five, six years, with you know the the rise of Netflix and all these streaming services, and then suddenly, TV and movies are coming onto digital spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it looks like there's like those two distinctions. Like there's kind of like a blurring going on now. Do you feel like yeah. ten years later there's still going to be like the way that we view traditional media, or it's going to change the scene altogether? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there is going to be a, a huge shift, and we we are living in such a momentous time as we are seeing this transition. You know, we're not only is there Netflix, now we have Hulu, we have Disney Plus, we have Peacock, Paramount Plus, like all these different streaming sites. And that's because Netflix essentially changed the game. And then, and furthermore, that's because platforms like YouTube changed the game, allowing us to have a space to create. And I think in the next decade, we definitely will see a shift in things. We, we're already seeing things. And I think when we think traditional, I think movie theaters will still exist um, mm -hmm. because it's a space of entertainment. Um, uh, I think like cable and television will continue to persist. Maybe it'll look a little bit differently, but you know, we're, we're in a very interesting time right now for all that. Definitely. I like how you mentioned movie theaters because I'm thinking how drive, like drive-in or drive through theaters like came back. I think it's drive-ins. Um, and it was so interesting to see something that was like phasing out and then suddenly come back. So things may have a chance depending on the world too. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even because drive-ins came back because of the pandemic, right? Like mm -hmm. what's a safe way to have this movie going experience? Um, but on the flip side to that, like these streaming services for the first time were premiering their films both in, in theaters and then also on these streaming sites. So a lot of things can change just within the last year. Totally, yeah. So given all of this, like, you know, this extensive experience you've had um, with media, what are some of your favorite works that you've been involved in, whether you've started in it, just directed, produced, all of that? Yeah, I think I often look back at my time at BuzzFeed as being like a really fun time where I created a lot of content 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, one project was Worth It Lifestyle where I got to work with Keith from the Try Guys and then also Quinta who is premiering a show that she's created and starring in soon on ABC and getting to work with them on Worth It Lifestyle was so fun. And it's a franchise that we really hold near and dear to our heart. and it was just a really good time to work with them. And also I really enjoyed working with Ladylike and particularly on the project on where we Photoshopped them into their favorite Barbies. We really took advantage of, you know, this trend on the internet of Photoshopping yourselves into certain objects or figures and whatnot. But then we put it on its head where I really wanted to bring in social commentary about just how often like media and even toys are influencing body image. And then uh, one of my other favorites for sure is uh, when I did an Asian men in media, in, in media and like TV and film, we did like a round table and I had Eugene uh, Li Gang hosted and we had like media 
uh, professionals just come in and just talk about just Asian men, how they've been portrayed in Hollywood um, ever since the start of it. I think that's super great. I'm definitely familiar with those videos. If anyone isn't, be sure to check them out. I was a huge like avid BuzzFeed watcher as many of my uh, peers might <laughs> also resonate with. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I have a few questions about um, some of the BuzzFeed videos that you're involved in. So back in like June 2018, just to contextualize like when that was a few years ago, almost to the day, um, you started, directed, produced and edited a video for BuzzFeed. It was titled Strangers Connect Through Their Deepest Insecurities. Um, I bring our attention to this because it was such a powerful video for me. I remember when it came out and then I rewatched it recently. I like really felt that. I like started tearing up in the first minute. I was like, oh, I gotta get through this video. Um, but I resonated with it because it's so rare to see people, but also specifically like Asians expressing their emotions, specifically like our negative insecurities. Cause there's this image where we have to always like be successful and it, has, it should all come with like ease. Um, for those of us who have never seen it, I'll have someone on my team put the link in the chat. Can you tell us more about the concept for that video and your experience in being so vulnerable with a stranger? Yeah, I, my entire mission in just creating content is to cultivate spaces to empower folks to be as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that has always just been my thing at BuzzFeed. And I've, I've made my fair share of dumb videos, I'll say. <laughs> um, but I also have made a, a lot of the videos I'm super proud of touch on social issues and social commentary. And this video in particular was really important to me because I wanted to talk about just vulnerability in a way that I haven't really seen it. And I, I wanted it to feel really authentic. And how I came up with the idea for it was that exercise is a iteration of an exercise that I used to do at workshops that I would have uh, at different campuses mm -hmm. um, when I was still doing like campus workshops in undergrad and whatnot. Um, I would often do this exercise with my attendees and I just found it to be really powerful, especially in the space of Asian and Asian Americans, because like you said, as a community, we don't often talk about our insecurities uh, to this great length. And yes, Vanessa, to the Unafsa days. Um, and I really wanted to see how can I tell this story about vulnerability and, you know, everybody who was involved in that video, we're all people of color. And so talking about that, it, there's an extra layer to it. Mm -hmm. And I took that exercise, put it in a video and I casted, you know, specific people who I wanted to have to convey a certain message and that has such powerful stories to tell. And I actually wasn't supposed to be in that video, mm. but my last person dropped out last minute. And so I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to step in and be in this video then. Um, and then I just ran with it. I, you know, to be honest, I didn't think it would go as viral as it did. Um, mm -hmm. because when something is so vulnerable and touches on so much potential social commentary, like it doesn't go as viral as you would like it comparatively to like, you know, like a, a hot shirtless dude, you know, like, you know, these are the, this is what the internet unfortunately gravitates towards. Um, mm -hmm. but I was really encouraged to see that it did get viral it did get millions of views and it continues to rack up views even to this day and I think it just speaks volumes as like again this yearning from individuals to be heard and seen in in a context they've never been able to feel represented before I think that's very deep I also love that you're just like I'll, I'll just step in um that must have been very like shocking for you to decide because you know you didn't really have to but you did it because you really believed in what you were making so yeah. yeah, I mean, also BuzzFeed too, oftentimes last minute things happen. I will say that hectic things that you see in videos happen in real life in the office. So it's very much that culture. I love that. Um, so kind of a little bit more behind the scenes on that. In what ways was it difficult for you and everyone involved with that video um, to be so like vulnerable, like honest and expressive? Because you, like you said, it could be difficult because you talk about like social commentary 
but also just putting that part of you out there, such a private part of yourself. How was that? Yeah, I think something that's really important is I, I want to preface like when you are ready to share your story to whatever capacity you should. And I think it's, it's so important to share your story because especially in the context of this video, I felt like it was important for us to all share really vulnerably because how often do you see people who may look like me or people who look like the rest of my cast speaking so earnestly about the things that breaks their hearts, you know? I, I think like there, there's something so innately human about that. And I think it's really important for us to put that forward. Um, I think something that oftentimes in the industry, especially for folks of marginalized communities is for creators and writers, directors, oftentimes we run into this issue where we think, is my story too niche, quote unquote? And mm -hmm. will people get it, you know? And I think oftentimes when we think about that, who are the people we're actually talking about? And oftentimes that narrative is spoken to white folks, white folks who historically have not gotten it. And I think the more specific, the more quote unquote niche your story is and the more vulnerable you are and willing you are to tell your story, the impact that you can have is monumental. And, you know, for me sharing my story, for the many amazing creatives in the past who've shared their stories, I think we just see that impact so much in that for us, even sitting here today, we're able to feel, we can look back and be like, okay, this was the first time I felt represented. And it's that moment, someone was in charge of that moment. Someone made that moment happen. And I just hope that in this current generation that we can create more of those moments so that for the future, folks are able to not only have one moment where they can pinpoint, but they have several. Yeah. You talk about representation. I know that really matters. Um, and you said that at first, you only saw yourself in like Mulan and even Power Rangers. Um, even after that, you know, as you go through your college days, was there another time that you saw yourself represented anywhere? In the context of just like media? Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, I mean, let me think back on my undergrad years. <laughs> um, what, you know, okay. This is the sad part is that like, I'm thinking about my undergrad years and I can't definitively name something where I'm like, Asian representation, you know, I can't think about that because I think it was just so far and few. And at that time, what examples could we really latch ourselves onto, right? Like, what was it like hangover? Like people were talking about Ken Jeong, but like, it's not for the reasons that we want, right? Like it, there was so much ridicule behind that. It was almost like caricature and it's really unfortunate. And like Ken Jeong has gone off and done a lot of great work since then. But at that moment in time in my college years, I didn't really have that much Asian representation on screen. And if you're not seeing it on screen, you're barely probably seeing it behind the camera. Mm -hmm. So I think that again, speaks volumes in how far we've come since then, but how much more work we still need to do. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Even now I know that people are talking about like this Asian wave in like media it still doesn't feel like enough because a wave means that, you know, eventually like subside and it'll end. But at the same time, we also see a lot more like East Asian, which is great, but there's a lot more to like Asian people than just this one narrative about East Asian people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think like with the Asian wave, like I love it. I love that since 2018 and with the premiere of Crazy Rich Asians that we've seen uh, so many projects get greenlit and seen the light of day. And it's facts, you know, like I, I went to the early screening of Crazy Rich Asians and director John M. Chu was there. And he literally said to us, everybody in this theater right now, when it comes out, go buy tickets, invite all your friends and family because there are so many Asian focused projects that are waiting on the success of this one film to get greenlit. And it's wild, but with the, 
success of Crazy Rich Asians, we did see so many projects get greenlit. Now, I totally agree with you because we are seeing a lot of East Asian representation. And not only that, but we are also seeing predominantly straight cis Asian representation. And I really feel like until we can get to a place where it's fully encompassing of our community and also touching upon intersectionality, then we are in a space where it's no longer we're underrepresented. We, are, we just exist and these are our stories of who we are. Yeah, honestly, facts. I saw Vanessa put up the little like cheer and I was like, me too. I just want to like, yes, all of that. <laughs> I resonate with it so much. Um, as a fellow like queer Asian, that resonates with me because it's like, it's like you can see parts of you represented, but it's not all of it. And so it's kind of disheartening still. Like there's more work to be done is what I always hear. And it looks like that's the same opinion you might have as well. Yeah. And I, I want to see more, more diversity within our community on screen and behind the camera. As you all know, like Asian is not a monolith. There's so much more than just what you've seen so far historically portrayed on TV or film. And so we need to get to a place where it really shows the whole diversity of everything. Definitely. Yeah, so speaking on internet sectionality, what does it mean to be both queer and Asian? You know, specifically, you know, being Southeast Asian, what does all that mean to you? Like, what do you hold when you label yourself that way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, for me, I find that the big life question I often run into is, who am I? You know, and I think that's a really relatable question for a lot of folks. And I feel like this question of who am I is constantly being asked for a lot of folks, especially in your 20s. And I think especially for folks who are queer. And I was talking about this the other day and that for queer folks, not many of us have the privilege of coming out at an early age. And for folks who are straight, you get to go through all these moments in your life where you get to go to you know your spring prom you get to graduate and all these milestone moments in your life um where you can just live so freely in who you are and i think being queer we don't always get that privilege and i find that your 20s maybe like if you feel comfortable enough to come out that's really when you start understanding this other side of who you are that you've been suppressing for so long. And then on the flip side of that, my Asian-ness has been apparent to me since the moment I was born. You know, mm -hmm. like I came out of my mom and nobody was like, that is a white boy. You know, like nobody said that. Um, <laughs> it's like, this is, this is an Asian man, you know, an Asian little baby. <laughs> so like, that has just been who I am forever. And, and I think like, <laughs> and I think like, when you think about the intersection of being both Asian and queer, there's this, there's this conversation and this tug of war almost of, am I, am I Asian first or am I queer first? Am I mm -hmm. too Asian in the queer community? Am I too queer in the Asian community? And specifically with the Southeast Asian identity, I am so proud of being a Vietnamese American. I am so proud to be a son of immigrants. And I just feel like there's so much there and it took a long time for me to be unapologetically myself and as well as being unapologetically queer. I think there's just so many conversations to be had because there's so much nuance in being a queer Southeast Asian person um, that like I find myself even every day learning something more and feeling even more in touch with who I am and my identities. I love that. Thank you for reflecting on all of that. It, I'm in my early 20s, so it really helps because I'm like, I'm having these questions now as I'm like, you know, transitioning out of college in, you know, trying to figure out these conversations with my family and then moving forward. So I appreciate this insight. And it, you know, it makes me feel okay that, you know, things will eventually be all right. Like I'll be able to be confident in who I am. Maybe not today, yeah. but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's completely relatable because to share about my story is that like I actually didn't come out until like a year after I graduated undergrad. 
And like, I had people who knew I was gay, but I wasn't fully out and proud until like a year after undergrad. And I think it's very, very normal. And I feel like it's also very relatable in our experience. Um, and I, 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 I have hope that in the future that, you know, coming out isn't something that we have to hold on so much weight onto and that we can actually have these moments where we feel safe and we can't express who we are. Yeah, I definitely agree. It actually segues really nicely into another video I was drawn to from your BuzzFeed days. It's titled, When You Fall in Love in the Closet. It's where you and other gay men reflect on being closeted gay and the anxieties of romance, specifically as a queer person, because romance in general is anxiety inducing. Um, it was also released in 2018 and it's a huge, heavy topic. Um, I actually only watched it recently because I don't think I was ready back in 2018. I was still like, of course I'm not, you know, gay or whatever. Um, but do you have any advice for, you know, our baby or even closeted queers who may be going through or have gone through some of these heavy feelings and emotions? Yeah, uh, specifically in, in the emotion of romance and having crushes is, is that the context definitely um <laughs> well let me tell you something uh being closeted for like up until the end of college pretty much i've had a lot of unrequited love <laughs> um and i think like it's hard and i'm such a sucker when it comes to love i am a, a hopeless romantic through and through and when I feel love, it's just like so intense. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like this person is my one. <laughs> and, and so like, I think, especially back then when I was in the closet and these feelings of unrequited love, it's, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it sucks. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you're in the closet and you don't know how to navigate that, well, just know and find at least some comfort that nobody does. Like this isn't like literally like this isn't something that you should have to feel on your own, if that makes sense. Because this feeling of unrequited love is universal. However, when you add on the layer of being queer and in the closet, it's a totally different story because you will look at your pre peers who are straight and they can if they want to, they can go up to their crush and be like, hey, I like you. Mm -hmm. But for me, if in high school, if I went up to my crush and said, hey, I like you, there's a world in which I could have gotten beaten up or worse, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, there is not only your emotional safety, but your physical safety wrapped into this narrative. And I, I think that I hope that there is at least some comfort in knowing that that experience is a very universal experience for folks who are in the closet. And if you're a baby queer and a baby gay, like I think it is so ridiculously scary to tell someone you like them, like sexuality aside, but then mm -hmm. when you're freshly out of the closet and you've never truly had the experience to tell someone the words, I like you, that is earth shattering. And what I would just recommend is taking a deep breath <laughs> and uh, knowing that you can do it and take baby steps. And don't compare yourself to other people's stories because this, the journey of coming out itself is so unique to the individual. Like my coming out story is different from your coming out story is different from other folks coming out story. But I think we can all lean on each other and get support from each other and our experiences and, and, and offer words of encouragement and, and advice. And if you're able to find like mentors that can help you navigate those feelings. I would just encourage you if you're, you're a baby queer, you're out of the closet at this point, don't, don't keep it all in here. Talk to your best friend, tell them like, I am crushing so hard on this person and I just need to vent to you, <laughs> you know? Like that, that has done oodles for me, at least from my experience. I think that's great, thank you. I love how uplifting it was because it is so hard <laughs> to go through those kind of feelings. And then just yeah. knowing that 
it's not just us like it feels like it, it feels so isolating um being in the closet because I mean it's a closet it's, there's nothing else in there it's just you um and I feel like that's so great that it's not that bad <laughs> it gives me hope it gives everyone hope I think yeah I I, I hope so fingers crossed <laughs> totally um kind of on to that so you said you know talk to other people where have you found community you know before you came out or even like just nowadays yeah I think for myself before I officially came out I would find pockets of communities where I felt really safe and it's funny because uh, Vanessa mentioned UNAVSA and if you're unfamiliar with UNAVSA it's the Union of North American Vietnamese Student Associations it is a mouthful but it is a nationwide uh, continent-wide nonprofit, and there was just it was just a safe environment that I actually tested the waters there first mm. to be out and also just like when I whenever I would introduce myself I'd be like yeah I'm, I'm gay um, and because these folks like were from different institutions and colleges and whatnot I didn't the, the stakes were a little bit lower mm -hmm. and when I found that group I was just like it felt very normalizing for me to be able to talk about my my sexuality and my experience and just at that time being a very much so baby gay and i think what i would recommend and encourage for folks is find spaces in which you feel already unapologetic before coming out and then when you come out you already feel safe there you know these spaces mm -hmm. and don't rush it of course but the, these spaces are really uplifting and i always you know recommend like surround yourself with people who uh, inspire you and uplift you and motivate you to become the best most authentic person that you can be and i i was able to find that in unafsa i was able to find that when i worked at buzzfeed you know like buzzfeed is so astronomically queer it's amazing like everybody there not everybody but a lot of people there are queer and when I came there I was just like oh my gosh like they're queers of like so many different experiences and I just felt so at home there and I from that I, I was able to find community I think that's so beautiful that you found you like tested the waters and then you like worked somewhere and you're like oh yeah this like this is the space to be in I think that's so great I'm um, actually I don't know about you now but too much was that how long were you involved with them, I should ask? Yeah, I was involved with them from 2012 till 2016. Yeah. Was that your undergrad years? I'm like trying to calculate that. <laughs> no, not, it's, not, it's not exactly my undergrad years. If you want to ask how old I am, we can no. go offline. Oh, no, I would never. I'm just because for me those years i was like high school and i was like wow that was like that's a really cool time to be involved in something <laughs> <laughs> yes there was a before time <laughs> very cool i love that um so talking about we we're talking about like social commentary and that reminds me of like building community how you're using your platform because you know you're talking about representation all these things um how have you used your platform to like build community or like is there any causes that you hold dear to your heart that you really wanna shout out right now? Yeah, I think for myself, it's always been about, you know, of course, just people of color, marginalized communities in general, but of course I hold near and dear to my heart, the Asian Asian American community, and then also the queer community and, and all the work that I've done, I really want to empower these communities as much as I can and, I think that has just been the biggest like motivation for me to do the work that I do. Um, and and what was the, the second part of your question again, too? I'm trying to remember now. I'm just kidding. Um, talking about, <laughs> just talking about how you've used your platform in these ways to support and build community. Right. So I think there's something special about digital content, as I mentioned earlier in our chat, that like you can literally pick up your phone and just create content and just put it out there in the world without any barriers to entry. And I feel fortunate in that in both, I often say that I have two jobs. One is my day job working at like Snapchat and Buzzfeed in the past. And then my other job is being a writer and director. And I'm fortunate in that 
both of those avenues allow me to really push forward equity and inclusion and diversity in these spaces because, you know, at BuzzFeed, I was always advocating for more representation on screen. I would always be advocating for, okay, what are the types of videos that we want to put out there and how can we just strengthen what it means to actually be a diverse company? And then same thing with Snapchat. So Snapchat, what I do now is I work with user-generated content. And what that means is all the snaps that you, uh, you know, video record and whatnot, and then you willingly submit to Snapchat, me and my team go through that. And then we get to uplift that content onto our feed. And so uh, for me, I'm always in rooms where I'm talking about, okay, I'm noticing that our feed may sway a certain community and I wanna ensure that we are having, you know, diverse spaces on there, diverse creators, and how do we continue to elevate those voices? And similarly, as my other job in writing and directing, all of my work there has been rooted in advocating for diversity and equity and inclusion, whether it is in the stories that I'm trying to tell itself or whether it is just how like the actors I choose to represent, the actors I choose to be the characters on screen, and then also the folks who are behind camera. So mm -hmm. for example, like in my short film, Blue Soup, it was a predominantly Asian and Asian American cast, but not only that, but nearly everybody, 99% of the people behind the camera was also Asian and Asian American. And that was something that I, wanted to make sure that we had in place. So just creating opportunities for people to thrive and grow in these spaces that historically we haven't really seen ourselves. I totally resonate with that. Since you brought up Blue Suit, let's really give it some hype. Um, this is your first independent short film, right? Before we like watch yes. the trailer together, because it's very short, can you give us a little bit more context into the thought process behind it? Like, why did you want to make your own short film like in 2020? So that was probably during the pandemic or right before? Yeah, so uh, we we finished editing and everything in 2020. We shot it in uh, October 2019. Mm -hmm. And the, the conception of Blue Suit really came from me just really wanting to process my feelings. Um, it's funny because we were talking about unrequited love earlier. And so I just really wanted to process my feelings about an experience I had with a friend. And I started writing because that's where I feel the most therapeutic. Um, and so I was writing and then I realized that I don't often see stories around queer Asian American men in the context of coming of age, but also romance and also saying goodbye. And I just thought, I need to make this happen. It's not just a story that I'm just going to write and keep for myself. I need to make this story. And so I went ahead and I made it in 2019. I had a Kickstarter for it and everything, and then was able to shoot it in October. And then we finished editing it in 2020. Nice. That's so great. And I saw that it was featured in a lot of like festivals. How did that make you feel to see that it was reaching so many audiences, reaching so many people who resonated with you? Yeah, it makes me feel so good because I will be honest in that like, I had such massive imposter syndrome before going into these film festivals and submitting. And it's because, you know, how often do you see a queer Vietnamese American filmmaker? Um, not often from my experience. And I just felt like as I was submitting this film, that will people, quote unquote, again, get it? Will it be good enough to be in these film festivals? And I was talking to my producers early on. I'm like, I'll be happy if we even get into two. And I think the reception has just been so encouraging and heartwarming to see that it's been screening across the country in the past year. It just really makes me feel that there is a hunger for these stories. And if anything, it just encourages me and I hope it inspires other folks that you can also write and direct and make your, your own stories from your own lives make happen and then it'll premiere film festivals, which is so awesome. I think it's so great. I love how 
you're like, this is so exciting. And it's not just like, oh yeah, it's like my story, but you know that there's going to, with the fact that you've made this, that there's going to be space for future stories to come out as well. You're a pioneer yeah. and I think that's amazing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate right. that. All right. Let's take a few, uh, like a minute or so to watch this together. Um, I'll share my screen unless someone else has stronger internet on my team. Or I'll do it. I'll share my screen and we'll watch this video together or the trailer that's on your website if anyone wants to re reference to it again. All right. Wait. I think that is the audio working for everyone. I think I messed up. Yeah, let me try that again. Oopsie. Sorry, I got really excited to watch it again. <laughs> there you go. Optimize. All right. One more time. Oh my God, please. Hey, Henry. I've actually been wanting to tell you this all summer. I just realized watching that again, that there isn't really a lot of dialogue. You just really let the video speak for itself. Um, what choice goes into making like something like this? Like, you know, trying to figure out what's a feature um, so you don't give too much of the story away, things like that. Yeah, I mean, my film is a short film. So that means um, total, it's only approximately 16 minutes and Short films typically are under 40 minutes long, and so mine is 16. And when you're cutting a teaser trailer for it, you're not gonna make like a three minute trailer because then that's like what a fourth of your film. Yeah. <laughs> so um, really what you work for, work with is you wanna go for 30 seconds to 45, uh, just to convey an emotion and I think for me, when I actually, I edited the teaser. And so when I edited it, I just wanted to make sure that we capture these feelings of just like yearning. I use that word a lot because it's like my MO as a writer, like yearning and meaningful connections. Um, and so I wanted to illustrate this feeling that the main character, John, goes through and just wanting that moment with Henry um, alone and just to confess his feelings for him. And, you know, the track that I use is relatively somber and like melancholy. And so I, I wanted to illustrate this story without giving a little bit too much um, away, but you get the, the premise that it all happens during a party and will John confess his feelings? Will he not? We won't know. You have to watch the film. Honestly, I, I loved how you captured the yearning. Um, I feel like I was like, wow, I was watching. I was like, yeah, I really felt that. And I wasn't sure how I felt it, but the way you explained, it, I was like, that's it. It's just, it's just that you're holding on to something really tight. And I think it's great. Um, so it makes me Thank really you. excited for it. Um, but so talking about that, you know, wanting to, having that yearning to confess your feelings, getting that alone time, that's a conversation that I've heard a lot in like queer Asian circles. What other conversations do you still think need to be had in film? Like what other stories do you feel need to represent rep represented as a queer Asian? Gosh, I mean, <laughs> I, do we have like several days to talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like we have yet to actually uh, like express the full breadth of the queer Asian community on screen. You know, like there aren't as many stories out there in films and TV that I, I would like focused on our story as a community and just from that, just our, our diverse stories within our community. And I think there's, there's so much there. Um, you know, this story of Blue Suit is a very, very universal story talking about on, like about love and just the will he or won't he and all of that. But I think there, there's so much 
that we can talk about, whether it be uh, talking about coming out is often uh, a narrative device uh, when, when there are queer stories, but then there's also talking about just like, how about intergenerational trauma and how that goes on for Asian and Asian American folks and coupling that with your queer identity. How about talking about just like mental health being queer and Asian? Let's talk about, you know, there's undocumented folks too who are queer and Asian. There's just like a whole array of stories that we have yet to really like dive right into. And what's really special is that these film festivals across the country and across the world really, they are uplifting these stories that oftentimes you don't see on the big screen. And I'm just happy to see that there is more of a push for diversity, especially in queer spaces and queer film festivals where they want to uplift stories of, you know, Asian folks and Latinx folks and Black folks. And, you know, like, it's just really, really encouraging. And I think right now is the time to be creating. I think it's a really special time. So great. I'm glad that um, you're very positive, like you're optimistic, you're like everyone should be creating because these stories will be like heard eventually. And I think that's so great. Um, so I'm really excited for Blue Suit. Is is there a chance for people to watch this in the near future? Um, is there a place where people can watch it now? Yeah, so if you go on my website, kjangwing.com backslash Blue Suit, you will see all the information about Blue Suit. You can follow along there. Uh, I have screenings across the country happening. Um, we Our next film festival is... I think it's the Houston Asian American Pacific Islander Film Festival um, that that's happening. And these festivals are happening virtually. So that's always great. And then if you can't catch it at the Houston uh, Festival, then there's also the Connecticut LGBTQ Film Festival. And that's also going to be virtual. So uh, I provide links on how you can buy tickets and learn more on my website and you can uh, and just so you all know, when you watch a short film, you don't buy that individual short film, you buy the entire program that it's in. So you'll get like a, a bundle of short films with it. And so you'll buy it and then you'll watch it when it goes live. Yeah, thank you for those tips. Um, is there anything else that people need to know about like film festivals and like specifically like short films in general? I mean, uh, I would just say support film festivals. A, a lot of these film festivals are organized by nonprofits and they rely on the revenue that they get on these film festivals to continue uplifting these stories across the world. So I think that's honestly one of the biggest things. And I would also just encourage you to just broaden your horizons on different film festivals, different programs within festivals, because you know there could be like a whole program for queer Asian storytelling, but then there could also be a whole program for like, like Asian feminism documentaries and like there's so much cool stuff out there and you often will get opportunities where you can have Q and A's with the filmmakers and you can interact with them and it's really fun. That's so exciting. I really love all of that. Do you have a particular favorite like film festival of yours? Like one they always come oh, back gosh. to, things like that. That's a hard question. So. Yeah, I mean, my, on the top of my head, I have two. One is the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival and they are so incredible. I believe they may be the biggest Asian Pacific Islander Film Festival in the country. Uh, don't quote me on that, <laughs> but they're large. They're really big. Um, and uh, I have a lot of friends who work there. I volunteered there uh, a couple of years ago and they're so phenomenal and they just really, they bring so much incredible storytelling and uh, the nonprofit that organizes it is visual communications and they do so much amazing work in the space of Asian and Asian American and Pacific Islander work um, and a lot of activism in that space as well. So really incredible things. Uh, the other film festival is Outfest and Outfest is also based here in LA and Outfest is so, so cool. And they have another film festival called Outfest Fusion that Blue Suit recently screened at. And Outfest Fusion focuses specifically on uplifting um, BIPOC voices in the queer community. And it's 
amazing. It's some of my favorite work. It's some of my favorite like organizers and filmmakers. It's so cool. So definitely check them out. That's great. Thank you. Seems like you have a lot of love for LA. I really like it. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I do love Los Angeles. That's why I'm here. That's beautiful. All right. We're at a good point. I want to open up the floor for any other questions that we've received or any questions in the chat that I might have missed. Let's see. I'm going to open up the chat now. Yeah. So Amy has a question in the chat. Um, question for you, obviously. <laughs> um, can you share more about collaborating and how the process looks like? How do you meet and connect all of that? Yeah, I think it's really true what they <laughs> it's really true what they say about the industry and that like it's really a lot of networking. And I think like you have to really put yourself out there. You have to know how to brand yourself as a creative um and for me i've just been really fortunate that in my day jobs that i've had in the past i've been also able to connect with really incredible creatives along the way like buzzfeed oh my gosh like they became some of my best friends till this day and now that a good chunk of them have gone and moved on from buzzfeed we're all like writers and directors, producers and stuff. And so it's just like that network of folks that you know you can rely on and to collaborate with. And then I also have moments literally where, you know, as my film is on the film festival circuit, I'll meet folks who really like my film and reach out to me and, you know, email me or message me on social media, just wanting to connect and sometimes uh, they'll even ask like, hey, would you be down for like a phone call or like a Zoom call? And then I'll have like a general meeting with them and uh, I'll just get to know them and ask them like, how can I support you? And they'll ask the same thing. And you start building a network of folks who want to continue supporting you and cheering you on in your journey in this industry. And I think what's special too is that for our community in particular, I have found a lot of benefit in Facebook groups. Um, Facebook has been interesting in that its main usage for me has been Facebook groups and uh, finding resources and ways to connect with people. So uh, there are Facebook groups like on the top of my head, like there's AZNs in entertainment. <laughs> and then there's a lot of like Asian folks in that Facebook group who are always looking for people to connect with. And I even use that as a resource when I was doing my Kickstarter for Blue Suit, when I was trying to crew up for Blue Suit. Like, I'm currently looking for a production designer. Like, does anybody have any recommendations? And then that's how you build your network of folks to collaborate with. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful way to build community, just like this online connection. You just DM. It's not like a formal, like, oh, send me an email or like get in touch with like my, like, my assistant. I've heard people say that. And I'm just like, just talk yeah. to me. Well, I don't have an assistant. I'm not there yet. <laughs> but, you know, maybe give me 10 years and maybe I'll, then I'll say, oh, shoot my assistant an email. <laughs> I love that. Also, I saw that when you said Frank can be your assistant. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Frank, if you want to be my assistant, that, that'd be great. <laughs> All right. It looks like we got some food questions for you. Um, what's your fall order? <laughs> uh, okay. This is a little controversial, but I don't love pho. <laughs> and it's not because I hate it. It's just I grew up eating it so much in my childhood that I'm like, oh, yeah, it's pho. You know, it's like it's like if you grew up eating chicken, noodle, chicken noodle soup all the time, you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's soup. Um, and so for me, when, <laughs> when I go out to restaurants, I don't actually ask or order pho. Um, and if I do, the bar is so high because my mom's pho is just so good oh. that I can only really exclusively eat my mom's pho because it's so amazing. And like, I've gone, like, believe me, I've even had like my Viet friends who are like, this restaurant right here has the best pho in LA. And I'd go, I'm like, it's good. You know, like, it's not the best I've had yeah. because that's my mom's. So, but it's good and I appreciate it and I, I will pay for it, you know. Um, but yeah, I, but is in my go-to Vietnamese order. 
I love that. You started a really good conversation in the chat. <laughs> yes. I like this I, comment. Controversial yet brave. I like, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I also agree with Vanessa. I will say I love Bumal Huay. It's it's one of my favorites. I will take Bumal Huay over Pho any day. I like it. We heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about your boba order? I hope this is not controversial because I hold boba so dear to my heart. <laughs> oh, I hold boba very near to and dear to my heart too. Right in the <laughs> test of this. Um, I have a lot of boba orders, but oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> my recent go-to favorite boba order that I get really excited about is uh, it's at Gongcha and they have this brown sugar London fog milk tea and it is out of this world. It is so good. I also have a massive sweet tooth. If you didn't notice by my order, but I do. And I have it at 100% sweet. I never get it half sweet. Not 200%. I've never done that. <laughs> 100% for sure. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. My condolences, anti-boba crew. <laughs> it's okay. We all have opinions. <laughs> yeah, it's okay if you're anti-boba. That's more for me and that's fine. <laughs> yes, that is the spirit, Fran. More for us. Exactly. Do you get boba as your topping or do you use like the other ones? Like some people like aloe jelly, mm -hmm. grass jelly, things like that. I think the beginning of when I was experimenting with boba, I listen, I grew up in Florida <laughs> and I went to school in Gainesville. <laughs> and so when our one and only boba shop, I would like try all the different things and I'd be like, okay, today's aloe, today's red bean, you know, all these different toppings but you know after going through my boba journey i just like a good boba <laughs> i think that's totally fair all right i got this question in the chat now i was actually curious about it too um if you like curry what is your curry order this is a very big question because there's a lot of different types of curry gosh oh, i love curry um i honestly i really enjoy okay two kinds of curry. I enjoy Vietnamese curry because it's it's very different from uh, if you haven't tried Vietnamese curry you need to try it. It's so good. I, I have to recommend. And then secondly I love Japanese curry. Like Japanese curry with like pork katsu or chicken katsu like uh, out of this world. <laughs> so good. Oh I want katsu now. <laughs> yes it's That's so, so yummy. So I love that. All right, let me see. All right, some non-food questions coming up now. They're giving you a break. Um, who inspires you as a creator? Oh, man. Um, I have a lot of inspirations. I, I would say one of my inspirations is definitely Andrew Ahn. He's a writer and director, too, and he... Uh, he made Spa Night, and then he also made Driveways so that came out um, back in 2019. Um, and he's amazing because he he's also queer and Asian, and his work has been rooted in that. And it, it really goes to show that like he has been such a pioneer in this space. And it's just really encouraging to see his success throughout the years. And I really am inspired by him. Uh, and I'm also really inspired by other creatives as well. I'm inspired by Barry Jenkins. He made Moonlight and just like the work that he's done and um, if Bill Street could talk, you know, all of his work has been so powerful and yet quiet, which is really inspiring. And, you know, I, I look towards other, you know, like on TV and whatnot, I, I would watch some of these shows and I would see like the people behind these shows are also really inspirational. Like, Right now, I'm really on this. I'm I'm writing a TV pilot right now. <laughs> That's what I'm working on, and I'm really focused on stories of um, these small communities that are trying that are trying to be taken over by like a predominant community. And you know, I, I think about shows like Hentified, for example, and Hentified is just so incredible, and the work and the stories that they've been able to tell just with the show with one season so far. And I'm excited for the second season um, to come out, but I'm really inspired by works of art and also creators. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, what is your advice for 
a senior, which I'm going to assume is like an undergraduate like myself, and how to use their passion for storytelling towards arts and in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, I almost feel like I'm talking to myself when I was a senior. And if I had words for that me and for all the seniors who are watching, I would just say like, just get ready. <laughs> just like, honestly, get ready. You're in for the ride of your life. And I think the biggest thing is don't compare yourself to other people, especially if you're going into the industry of the arts and entertainment. Everybody has such a different journey. And especially if you are a student who is of a marginalized community, who is you know, a person of color, the imposter syndrome is real. And I'm not going to sugarcoat that either. And I think like you will have to do a lot in order to overcome that imposter syndrome and that imposter syndrome won't just turn off one day. But what I can encourage you is find your people, find your community, find the people who uplift you, find the people you're inspired by, connect with them, become friends with them. Those are your people. And those are the people who will cheer you on when you get success. And those are the people who will lift you back up when you feel at your lowest. And I would so much encourage that so much. Find, find your people, find a mentor. And those are the people who will be your biggest cheerleaders throughout your career, for sure. I appreciate that. Um, a follow-up to that is, do you have any words of advice for future queer storytellers wishing to enter into like this industry, this profession? Yeah. I think very much similarly, like finding your community. But if you want to enter this industry, also there is so many different avenues that you could take. First, figure out what you want to do because the industry is so large, right? Like, do you want to get into TV writing? Do you want to get into filmmaking? Mm -hmm. um, and do you want to make a short film or do you want to make a feature? And then from that, what genre do you want to work in? Like even outside of like TV and film that is applicable to other like very hyper creative careers and ask yourself those questions and also ask yourself, how would you like to brand yourself? What, is, what are the stories that you're trying to tell? And I often use this analogy in that imagine yourself going to a house party, which I think we can, all can relate at some point, right? <laughs> going to a house party. And then you go into this house party and just imagine the industry is this house party. Imagine all of arts and entertainment it is this house party. And in this house party, there are different circles of people talking about different topics, right? There's this one circle talking about puppies. There's this one circle talking about political news happening today. There's another circle talking about slime, you know? You have entered this party late and you want to enter into one of these circles, but how are you going to bring a fresh perspective into these circles? Because they've already been talking about this since the beginning of the party and you're late to the, you're late to the party. And that, that is the case for all creative work. Mm -hmm. All this creative work has been done but what is your specific perspective and how do you want to utilize your own story to propel the work that you do? And I think that's, that had, for me, I've had to learn that in my career and I wish I had known that early on in my career so that I could focus on branding myself. Yeah. I think it's really insightful. I love the analogy you use, even as someone who's not going into like creatives, I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. It totally like resonates. I'm like, pretty cool very easy that's how you know like you've made it like you definitely understand where you are because you can explain it so easily to other people <laughs> cool thank you i appreciate that oh, a little tougher of a question at least in my opinion but how do you navigate working in a predominantly white industry and not have your content feel like whitewash or like palatable is kind of the word that i would use yeah it's funny because i feel like i've been getting this question frequently um in the q a's that I participate in. And I would just say that like, 
there is there is like a tug of war almost like what hills are you willing to die on and you, film and tv is such a collaborative space as well that like the powers that be historically have been white cis straight men and for stories where it is farther and further away from those identifiers then it can feel very foreign and then therefore less likely to get approved and green light. Mm -hmm. What I have to say to that is pick your battles. And I will also say that perhaps maybe I'm a little bit more radical, but I also am not willing to bend over backwards for white folks. <laughs> and this is my story. And if you're not going to subscribe to my queerness, and if you're not going to subscribe to my Vietnamese Americanness, then I'm not for you. And if my piece of work isn't going to resonate with you and you don't want to green light it, then this isn't going to be a fit. If I have to change my story that I'm trying to portray out there in the world, this isn't going to work. You can find someone else, but I, I can't work with people who want to overshadow my story and what I know to be true and authentic for the sake of dollar signs, because we know that's untrue. Mm -hmm. We know that's untrue because we've seen Lulu Wong break barriers with the farewell and how she wasn't willing to compromise her script, her story that is so near to her. And then where did it go? It got made. And then it was all over award seasons. You know, it put like Aquafina on the map after that, you know, Crazy Rich Asians was there, but then the farewell showed her the, the breadth of work that she could do. It put Lulu Wong on the map, you know, as a director, an established director. And now she's got so many opportunities since then. So that is all to say that pick your battles, be smart about it, but then also don't compromise your voice, especially when you know in your heart that it is true to who you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. With all these words of advice, can you summarize or do you have like three tips, just three, on how to be a good storyteller or a speaker? This is specifically for a junior undergraduate Asian immigrant student. Yeah. I think it really goes on a couple of the points I already made. So one, know how to bring yourself. If you can boil down who you are in 90 seconds and you can tell me in 90 seconds who you are, You've got a down path, you know. That will take you so far in your storytelling because oftentimes, if storytelling is something that is uh, in conjunction to your career, a lot of times people are going to be like, What's your perspective on this? What's your angle? What types of stories are you going to tell? So, know your brand, know who you are, know your story. The second tip is really how can you how can you use the stories that you already know you feel comfortable with and how do you articulate them right so what are the avenues in which you find that it would be impactful i think that's really important so for me in particular i find that my version of storytelling is through tv and film and and writing and so that's one way of doing it is it the only way absolutely not there are many, many different types of ways to do this work. And then third, um, I think really just like being really receptive to feedback. I think that is so important for your growth. And I think like the feedback, you can agree with it or not, but if you're getting that piece of feedback more than once, then it's not, it's not a them problem. It's unfortunately a you problem. <laughs> and like, you have to, you have to address it. And I say that with a lot of love and care because I've gotten that as well, where I'm like, okay, like I got feedback on like this portion of my script, then, okay, I can take it or leave it. But then I got it again from a different person. I'm like, these two people don't know each other. And if it's making them, if, if it's bumping them, then I need to address it. Because if I want this, let's say, TV pilot to be seen across the world, those two people are probably like hundreds and thousands of people that it's going to bother. So I'm, I need to address it. 
So this work is very collaborative. Allow yourself to be as collaborative as possible and stay humble and just continue looking for, for ways to grow and learn. I think, I think that's really important. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know Kel was three steps with like extra bullets in between because <laughs> it's so hard. It is hard. It is. It's a lot. It's a lot. And if you, if you, if we can talk about this forever. Uh, I, I have all the advice for it and I'm still learning myself. So yeah, it's a, it's a journey for sure. That's beautiful. All right. To break up some of these advice questions, uh, opinion here. Um, do you like watching anime or do you like it as an art form? That could be a better question. Frank is laughing because he knows the answer to this question. <laughs> And the answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, love, I love that because as I mentioned, at a very young age, I didn't really see Asian or storytelling that felt really authentic to me. Now, am I saying like a ninja in the Hidden Leaf Village is authentic to my story? Absolutely not. But what I am saying is that I think there is a instinctual natural connection to works of art that is created and crafted by the hands of someone that feels very familiar to you and I think that speaks volumes and I think for me even at a young age even though I didn't know anime was made by Asian folks I could deduct it by the style in which it was animated the storytelling that it was having that was being portrayed on screen and so I I really loved it. I, I love that um, that medium, and I, I love that so much. I think, like, I think there's <laughs> a lot of um, opinions about it, um, but I think like anime as an as an example of like a an Asian form of entertainment. I think it's great. I also feel the same way about like Korean dramas. I think for so long, like in the vein of Korean dramas and anime, that these you know, imported Asian pieces of entertainment was so frowned upon here in the States. And it wasn't until recently in the past five years, I would say, that it's gotten more global and more welcomed in the States. Um, I'm happy to hear that. But, you know, for me, I really appreciate that art form because it, it shows you a different way of storytelling that isn't so westernized. Definitely. Do you have what are your anime and K-drama recommendations then? What are your top of the top list? Uh, gosh. I mean, anime wise, I grew up watching Naruto. Am I saying it's the best? I, I think it was the best at the time. I think anime has progressed since then. Um, Naruto is iconic. Um, but also, I would also say like Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is really phenomenal. Uh, Frank and I watch a lot of anime together and uh, one of our recent favorites is uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, which is really phenomenal. Yes. Um, and then in terms of K-dramas, I'm late in the game, like a year late, but I just finished watching Crash Landing on You. Oh, and so good. It wrecked me. I watched it and I went to Frank and I was just like so emotional after I watched it. It's so good. I, I loved that K-drama. I love AK1 class. I also love Master Sun. Um, those are some of my favorites. Nice. I haven't seen some of them, so I'm like writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so great. I agree with Crash Landing on you though. That oh, it's too much on me. Cool. Yes. Someone so did good. ask, what are your thoughts on Bling Empire? That's a reality show, right? <laughs> it is. It is a reality show. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. And I will save some of those thoughts because I think what is most productive is just to talk about this, this show being one, I can appreciate the show in that it has offered a lens into the Asian community. And also it has provided more opportunities for Asian folks. So whether it is the stars or the folks working behind the camera, and I can appreciate that because at the end of the day, that grants more opportunities. And then those people know people. And then we get more folks from the community going, getting these opportunities that often before wouldn't get those opportunities. Also, we can talk about how there now is kind of this narrative of 
um, crazy rich Asians. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a very Hollywood thing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's a very Hollywood thing where if they see the success of one thing, let's make so many versions of this as possible. So it is unsurprising to me to see shows like Bling Empire and House of Poe, I think, um, exist after mm -hmm. Crazy Rich Asians because Hollywood was probably like, oh, Crazy Rich Asians was a blockbuster. America wants rich Asians. They're profitable. Let's put them in front of a camera. Let's tell their stories. So it's purely on, on, on the crux of dollar signs, capitalism. Um, now, what I want to talk about more about though, is just, that is just one part of this very complicated puzzle of Asian representation and the stories that we need to tell in the industry. Um, and I think though those entities can hold space, but I think what we need to challenge Hollywood is to create and hold space for stories that aren't just rich Asians, hold stories where it is of different socioeconomic statuses. It is of different experiences being men, women, non-binary. Like there's so much intersectionality and diversity again in our community that I, I want to challenge Hollywood to hold space for all of these other stories that are just as profitable, but have yet to be greenlit. I agree with that. I love that. Maybe I should, maybe I should be into what's going on recently. I haven't watched anything new, so it's good to know. That's great. Um, I actually really like this question. It's someone submitted through registration. Um, they asked, do you happen to still struggle with your queer identity and how has queerness affected your relationship with your parents? It's pretty deep. Mm. That's a really good question. I would say, uh, I would like to say I don't struggle with my queerness as much. Are there days where I'm just like, my life would probably be easier in this one particular instance where I'm getting some frustration if I were straight? I have those moments. <laughs> I have those moments for sure. But I would also say that I would not trade my queerness in for the world. Like I am so proud of being queer that and it's taken a long time in my journey to get to this point. But I uh, more often than not, thankfully I'm in a space where I can love and accept who I am and in, in my queerness. Now, how does that relate to my relationship with my parents? It's a little bit different um, because my, I came out to my mom not too long ago, or maybe it was a while ago. Time is a construct while in pandemic. Um, but really? when I came out to my mom, she was surprised and also really deeply saddened by it. Mm -hmm. But and now we're in a place where we don't really talk about my queerness, uh, nor do we talk about relationships or anything. Before she would always ask me like, oh, are you like, are you going to go hang out with your girlfriend? I'm like, no, I'm just hanging out with my friends. <laughs> and so um, she stopped asking me questions like that. And I think we're just at a place where we don't talk about it. And I think that's a very, you know, unfortunately common experience for a lot of folks. Um, and my relationship with my dad in terms of queerness, I haven't told my dad I'm queer, but I'm pretty sure he knows, <laughs> nor do I feel like or compelled to tell him that I'm queer. Um, because again, I, I'm at this place in my life where if you know I'm queer, you know I'm queer. I'm not hiding it. <laughs> it's who I am. And again, it, you can either subscribe to it or you're not, but it's who I am. I'm, I'm not changing for it. I think that's great. That's the best way to answer that. Um, I know we're hitting that minute mark. Uh, last question, and then we'll let everyone go off to their actual dinner. Um, what question do you wish you were at? Do you wish like you were asked in interviews? And how do you answer that question? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. A question I, I wish was asked. 
Um, I feel like it really depends on the space that I'm in. And if, if the space is, you know, typically like the entertainment space that isn't specifically Asian, I wish I got asked more questions around just like how diverse our community is and what can allies do to continue to uplift our stories, but also just like stories of underrepresented communities. Um, I think like that question isn't asked enough. And I, I wish like, I wish people did the work <laughs> and there were more resources for like allies to know how to engage and to um, effectively support our communities. I think that's really important without of course the labor always being on us, right? So I think that's also equally as important. Yeah, thank you. I know some folks are heading out, but this is it. Thank you for all your time, all the words, all the fun that we've had in this conversation. Um, before we let everyone go, I'd love to take a screen grab just to show that we were in community together for the folks that are left. So if people want to turn on their cameras, I think Kayla, you're going to count us down. Sweet. But thank you for being here. We all appreciate your words, your presence, all the advice. I think it makes me feel better as a creation as well. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Love to see the beautiful faces. <laughs> all right, Kayla. All right, is everyone ready? I will count down. Three, two, one. All right, perfect. Thank you all. All right, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Kevin, especially for your time. Made you talk for like two, like an hour and a half and just telling us personal stories. Um, <laughs> all good. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. It was boys. so fun to be here. Thanks. If you ever want to get in touch with Kevin, check out his website. I've linked it a few times in the chat. Um, feel free to reach out to us as well at Merit Program Services, and we hope to see you at a future event. We actually have one tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. on disaggregated data and higher education. I will be moderating again if you like me, so hopefully I'll see you all there. <laughs> have a good evening, everyone. Hope you have a great dinner. Bye, y'all.